down to Miami and really started working to see if we could get this thing. So I was back and trying to get this thing reestablished. And sure enough, she said yes. Um, and this exhibition, of which I think Martin Culture did a nice review of this exhibition, was organized by uh, Dorian Bergen. And this was her first time You're stealing my. Oh, OK, OK. So, <laughs> so, so, so but no further ado, let me, let me put you in. Oh, so, OK, so the way that this will work, really quickly. Uh, so Dorian will talk about the exhibition and other things. Uh, and then Faith will just be here for questions. She'll open it up. Well, I'll open it up for questions, and, and she's yours. We'll have about an hour, uh, about 40 minutes to go at it, and, uh, and she's yours. So without further ado, Gloria Murray. It's 
study the rocks. Don't let it happen. I have a foundation. Anyone can fly. And I started it for the children to learn and understand. Anyone can fly. All you got to do is try. All right, is there, oh, is there another question?
that I did my art. So I had my art from the beginning. My father bought me my first easel. So art was taken for granted. I was going to have the art. Now nobody said, when you grow up, you're going to be an artist. No. That wasn't discussed. Art was a natural form of expression, obvious to children. When I graduated from high school, I have been told all my life, when you graduate from high school, you're going to college. They never mentioned to me what I was going to be there. Because women didn't work in the 30s, OK? So it wasn't about what I was going to be. It was about what I was going to do. And I loved art, always had it. So I was going to do art. No discussion on being. OK? So when I got there and they said, well, OK, what kind of degree do you want to get? Oh, well, I don't know about that. That's that part. Well, they said, well, I tell you, uh, a liberal arts degree, what do you want to what do you like doing? So I said, I guess if I have to pick something, I want to be an artist. So they said, well, this is a boys' school, the City College of New York, right in my neighborhood. And girls, women, cannot get a liberal arts degree here. I'm shocked. Now, mind you, I used to see the boys pouring up out of the subway and up the hill and down Convent Avenue to City College. But it never occurred to me that there weren't any women, any girls, because I was always taught you can do anything you want. So not that there are not any girls there doesn't mean girls can't go there. It just means there's not in that group. That's all it means. So in the confusion, I said, well, I don't, I don't know what to do now. I, I'm going to City College. So how am I going to do that? They're telling me that this is a boys' school, and they don't have a degree for me. So somebody came in, one of the teachers, and she said, listen, let me say what you can do here. You can come here. You can't get a liberal arts degree, you know. But you can get a Bachelor of Arts in Art Education. So you can major in Art and minor in Education and Teach. I said, oh, now my family was love. <laughs> Teaching was it, you know. Yeah, because all of them were teachers. All right, so I said, that's fine, I like that. And I'm all glad. That's the reason why I'm sitting here with you today, because I did become a teacher. I taught little children, big children. I taught the college. I have taught every age group. And I can tell you, having taught every age group from kindergarten to college, the little ones are the best. <laughs> I'm serious. And that I taught them really enhanced my work. It taught me the freedom that they have and the love that they have of creativity. So in a way, that kind of exclusion that they had in City College, saying, you know, women can't really be here, this is a boys' school, benefited me. Because I, how would I have gotten to know them? If I had a liberal arts degree, I would never have learned that the children were the best. But the Bachelor of Arts in Science, in, 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 in um, teaching, taught me that, being exposed to the little kids. And uh, I have a foundation. Anyone can fly a foundation. I tribute it to them. I owe everything to them. They are the best.
see all of the major revolutions, up to and including uh, Obama being president of the United States. I want to ask, and, and one of the things I've noticed about your your hard work, it seems to elude a pleasantness or a life that keeps moving on. So can you tell me what are the dynamics that you see in the black community that allow us to transfer all of these various movements up to and including Obama? Good question. Good question. Having come here on those ships as slaves was an experience that was debilitating and what enlightened. We survived it. Early on, we survived uh, and worked and built this country. Where would this country be without 400 years of black history? Mm -hmm. Nobody's been able to answer that question because it wouldn't have survived. Who could have worked like we did and yet retained the what the drive and the inspiration uh, to be that African Americans had? Other people couldn't do it. The Europeans tried to come in and build this country; they couldn't do it. The Native Americans tried to do it; they couldn't do it. Here comes the Africans over here. Uh, as slaves, many of whom were murdered on the way or jumped overboard. Or, and I look back at, at my ancestors who built this country, and I am so proud of them. It inspires me, and I know it inspires a lot of you. Yeah. 
and it has to do with a fellow person. And I think maybe there's an Eminon mass downstairs, so that would give you AIDS also, because Eminon, the AIDS is all about my grand grandmother's death, Father John's family, who took such beautiful care of her when she was a child, and homeschooled her and did all that stuff. Anyway, was the fashion designer did the clothes for the soft spot sharks. That's the true. Decoration. Right. Before 81, she had my grandma. We had my grandma. Then after 81, so much is about things that have happened since then. But one of the things I was thinking about the accumulation of work that we're talking about, because for the 70s, I think we were all cataloging the work in different ways. Um, there's so much. There's so much for each decade. And then you see a show like this. And what you realize, I was going to say this, I, I didn't know if you mean anything to me, but it's like a compounded interest. That's the way it over it. You know, so she started with two one woman shows in the 60s. And then she moved from the slow, slow burn with compounded interest. Many of you all know what compound interest is. I hope you do. I hope you're getting some compound I retired. Well, I also want to uh, use this opportunity to thank Dorian, who is the, uh, her and her husband, Jeff, who are the directors of the ACA gallery. And I used to constantly be looking at for the art of African Americans to inspire me because art comes from your ethnicity, from who you are, you make art that looks like you, that is you. And Dorian, in the, uh, uh, they opened in 1932, and they were one of, if not the only gallery that showed African American artists as well. It was very difficult to find a gallery to show your work as an African American artist. And this is the gallery, ACA, that I always wanted to belong to. But I didn't want to ask them. Because if I asked them and they said no, then what am I do? You understand? I, I like them. Some other galleries, I don't care. Yeah, they say no. They but I didn't want ACA to say no. No, but I found out that Dorian's father, Sid, who started the gallery in 1932, yeah. oh, the great uncle, so it's a family gallery, and his, uh, her father, I mean, uh, Jeff's, yeah, Jeff. Jeff's father, Jeff's father told a friend of mine who was at the gallery one day, that he really liked my work. And my friend, Linda, knew that I wanted to be an ACA gallery. I was in some other gallery, but I wanted an ACA. But I didn't want to ask, because I didn't want to hear no. And so she said, he said he liked my work, because Linda was there filming for huh? And she said, oh my goodness. I could have called her and told because she would love to know that. She wants to be in this gallery. And he said, he does? And, and, and Linda said, yes. And he called, he called me. And Sid came to my house. And we've been together ever since. Oh, my goodness. I have, I have three questions over here. But let me just tag in one little bit about ACA gallery. Of course, you know, it's, not, it's, it's hard not to, in these wacky political times, not to make some statement about the state of the country right now. But, you know, we did a show here, The Abolitionist, and that show was, we had a sign on the bottom of the stairs that had the, uh, the Mexico City John Carlos Tommy Smith sign, and we said, where's the guy, the third guy, the white guy, the Peter Norman? And Peter Norman suffered severe consequences for taking a stand with Tommy Smith and, and uh, John Carlos in Mexico City. Uh, we're, and one of the things that came out of that is if you 
or are not African American and you take a stand, and we pose the question, where are those people now? Where are the Peter Normans now who are standing up for us? Well, this is all that actually come back to say, ACA, ACA gallery stood and they took the consequences because there was a period in time, four generations, where they were blacklisted uh, uh, for, for showing African American artists. Uh, so the next question is here. Started with actually, you saw, you saw the Tonkas at the 
Rotterdam and Amsterdam and totally changed your direction because it was a very practical way of making very was the 70s. In the 70s, 72, 74. It was all this progression. <laughs> and then Yvonne died and you did Mother's Quilt. And that felt like it really changed things. Yeah. Uh, when I first saw this exhibit uh, two or three weeks ago, I had never heard the term car beach, and it took me a little while to figure out what it was about. Having always loved roof gardens, I wondered how common were these tar beaches where you grew up, and was that a term that everybody was familiar with, or was it something that your parents made up to make you happy? A work of art, I have to give Bernie Steinbaum. I don't know whether any of you have ever heard of her. She, she wrote, I belong to Bernie Steinbaum's now for you. And she was a wonderful gallery owner. And she was giving me my first show. And she said, okay, Faith, I want you to create a series of works that will be in the show. Because we're going to promote your work with one work, but we're only going to show the one before the show. But you're going to make a whole new series that nobody's going to ever have seen before the show, right? So I, I said, what am I going to do but with that one that she's going to use to promote the show? I think I'm going to do something that was Oh my God, everybody loved to go up on the roof in Harlem. I was born and raised in Harlem. And everybody wants to go up on the roof because we, there is no such thing as air conditioning, okay? So everybody went up on the roof in the summertime and it was the only time that we could snack. We were not allowed to eat except three meals a day, okay? No snacks. Only dessert we had was on Sunday. However, if we went up on Tar Beach during the summertime, we could have some watermelon and some other snack things. That was a trick. Uh, we had to lay down on the roof because you couldn't have you couldn't run around on the roof you fall, right? So Tar Beach was what it was called going up on the roof. I don't think people can go on the roof and do a picnic and carry on like that anymore. Okay? People don't, you know, they'll throw you off or whatever. <laughs> um, no, that's not anymore. But in those days, I don't know, somehow we loved each other. It was okay. If somebody came to visit us and we were up on Tar Beach, my neighbors on the floor would say, oh, Willie and your daughter's uh, they're up on the roof and, and uh, leave your things here with us and go out there and join them. It was amazing, but our door was open. Nobody came in and robbed us. It was fantastic. Brady Stein, by the way, was a, a series for the show. And uh, I have always worked in series because it works. So that series I call on the roof, or women, women on the bridge, women on the bridge, because women should have everything that a bridge has, the ability to transform and from place to place and so on. So the, I called it the Woman on a Bridge series, and I do a series of women on bridges, flying and taking over and so on. Because we need, especially today, to take over what is going on. Okay? <laughs> Get my point? Women! All women need to be involved. Because if we have been as we should have been, you know who would not be in the White House. <laughs> okay? How old were you when you started sewing? And um, what made you want to sew? And um, I'm homeschooled, and did you give me any tips on um, how many? Yeah, and me some tips on homeschooling her. And any advice you would give me? Yeah! And we're over two. So we're really going to get help from lots of people to give 
her everything she needs. And uh, there are all places, and I am not familiar with them because I've been out of the business for a while. So I could, my daughter does some uh, tutoring for children. She's a, not this one, but another one who also tutors. Now, what's the other question you asked me? Okay, now understand something. These quilts that you see are not quilts as such. They are paintings. They are on canvas. Okay? And uh, the, 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 the only sewing in it is to keep them together with the background so that I could make them as huge as I wanted them to and I wouldn't have to worry about uh, the height and the uh, weight, the weight and the framing and all of that. And so that's why they look like that. But those pictures are not quilted. Those pictures are painted, okay? And um, also, I would not have anywhere near the amount of work I had if I did quilts as such, because it takes a lot of time. Wow. Um, the art, the expressions in the art, the time, the season, um, they're so clear. Um, if you were um, expressing or, or, or doing art from, let's, let's say, from 1980 to up to today, how would that art look? I mean, what would be some of the expressions, especially coming from the, the African-American what, what would you be expressing? Well, I think in the 1980s, let's see, what was I doing in it? Well, I was making uh, art that I used in the quilt. I think the quilt started in the 1980s. And, yeah. And that didn't happen. Right. And also, I was trying to get my autobiography, we flew over the bridge publisher. And it was exceedingly difficult because the publisher whom I had who thought she wanted to publish my book said, this is not your story. So I said, oh my God, this woman is going to tell me what my story is. <laughs> Because many African American women had been told that their story was particular to a certain group of, of famous African American women who had written that they were born in poverty and that they had been raped and beaten up and this and that. And I didn't have that experience. We don't all have the same experience. I'm sorry. And I don't have to have that experience to be an African American woman. And the public, I'm sorry. So I said, okay, here's what I'm going to do. They're not going to publish my story as it is. We flew over the bridge is the name of the story. So what I have to do is write my story without them publishing it. How can I do that? I'm going to make quilts and I'm going to write my story on them. I'm going to write my story on my heart. Superwoman back in 27 years old. And 
I wanted her to write the story on of of uh, Audra Who's and you know what she said? She was 30 and she said, no, I'm not going to write. I don't know anything about Aunt Jemima. <laughs> or Aunt Jemima. I don't know anything about it. I'm not doing it. So I said, oh, okay. So I have to do it. No. She used to say that I said, I didn't say this, but she said that I said, I run six miles a day so that I don't ever have to look like Aunt Jemima. <laughs> And I kept writing until I got published. Because anyone who's black, all you guys do is you gotta tell me what my story is. That's the height of racism right To tell you why you feel a That's if you're not going to feel a feet. I mean, you tell me what my story is. I have a right to say what my story is. And to get it published, and I can't. Now, mind you, it took me 15 years. <laughs> 15 years to get that book published. To get that book published. Which is called We Flew Over the Bridge. The Memoirs of Faith. The Memoirs of Faith Bengal. It was initially published by Joe Brown in 1995. Got it. And then, <laughs> and that is the book by Duke University Press. Opportunity to ask you and or your daughter to say something to the children in the room. You can't do anything you speak to. I didn't say it's going to be easy. No. But you have to have determination and anyone you fly and others will be inspired to help you. You need help. But that's how you get inspired. That's how, that's how you get the people who inspire you to help you by trying, continue to try. This is a great country in that respect. You can do it. You can come from nothing to something. You can do it. All right? Yeah. My question is, what do you think your role as an artist is to maintain the culture of Harlem in the face of gentrification. Oh, Harlem is, I had Diana Washington, you know that thing? Uh, yeah. I had her apartment, and nobody can get it from me. It's now full we own it, I still own it. It's just not big enough to house what I'm doing. So that's why, that's why we have a, a bigger studio in Englewood, New Jersey. But uh, Harlem is fantastic. She's a real estate wizard. <laughs> well, to be an artist, I think you do need a little 
videos that yeah, you did. Now, what was the other question from somebody else? Artists. I'm artists as well. I sing. However, my question is, from a black standpoint as a woman, what would be your words of encouragement to stick in your lane and tell your story? Don't allow anyone to stop you. However, singing, you people, African American women who sing, they're the tops. There is nobody better than that. Nobody. Number one. And that is because no one can stop you from singing. All you gotta do is open your mouth and let it out. Huh? Yeah, we gotta get you to go somewhere, and then we gotta make it and show it to you. And I'm like, you don't have to do that. Just have to open your mouth and let beauty just come pouring out. So that is why you all are number one in the world. You can go anywhere in the world, and you're going to hear the voices of fantastic African American women. I'm going to be sing up a hip below.